This needs to be said first and foremost. All views expressed in this video are my own, not necessarily shared with the creators of Digimon Digital Adventures, and this video is definitely not officially sponsored by them, Toei, Bandai, or anyone else with the rights to Digimon or the system at hand. Sorry for the delay, I've not been feeling well these past couple of weeks, so that's why there hasn't been any uploads. I've been updating people on my Twitter, where you should go follow me just to make sure you don't miss anything. But yeah, we're gonna move on with part 5. Today, we're covering combat. So you remember how I said in the last video that dice rolls were used when the outcome of something was in doubt? Yeah, combat is that taken to its logical extreme, when words won't cut it, and it's going to come to blows, combat starts. Combat in DDA, like other TTRPGs, is a turn-based system. Every player has a turn, a time for their character to act that is mostly an abstraction, within something called a round, which is a full set of turns for every character currently participating in the combat. To determine what order the turns take place in within a round, all characters roll 3d6 plus agility on their Digimon. If a player lacks a Digimon character for some reason, they roll 3d6 plus agility plus fight on their human instead. Tamers and Digimon share their turns, and if two characters would tie on their initiative, the character with the higher agility goes first. If the tie persists, the GM should give players the higher turn order, and if the tie is between player characters, at this point, the players can choose who goes first. The GM can allow some situational modifiers for initiative. This is up to GM discretion, and the example the document uses is a cautious tamer being able to add their intelligence stat to their Digimon's initiative or taking time planning things out. There's also something called a surprise round. Surprise rounds add plus five to the party's initiative rolls, and for the entire first round of combat, the enemies they're fighting don't get to make any attacks. Surprise rounds count as sneak for the purpose of activating qualities. Once initiative has been determined, it's time to act. Tamers and Digimon both have a pool of two actions they can use. A simple action consumes one action from the pool, while a complex action consumes both actions. This means a tamer or Digimon can take either two simple or one complex action. Though there are ways to modify this, such as some effects as we discussed in the Digimon video, or hybrid evolution as we discussed in the last video. Now, as we discussed a while back, Digimon have multiple attacks they can use. However, this is because they cannot use the same attack more than once per round. The exception to this is that the Digimon only has one attack, and with tamers. Tamers don't have any named attacks, so they can only use the one they have. That said, all Digimon have a melee damage tagged attack that they can use. So, if your GM prefers, they can simply let your lower stage Digimon make that basic attack, or you can make that basic attack at any point. When your Digimon makes an attack, they roll a pool of d6 dice equal to their accuracy stat, plus any modifiers from qualities such as weapon. They then set aside any successes, fives or sixes, and count those as, well, successes. Their target then rolls their dodge as a d6 pool, following the same rules for successes and qualities, setting aside those successes. The attacker and defender then compare successes. If the attacker has the same or more successes, they hit with their attack and deal one point of extra damage for each success they have that goes beyond the defender's successes. So, if the attacker rolled 10 successes and the defender rolled 8, the attacker would get plus 2 to their damage with that attack. Every time a Digimon dodges, they suffer a stacking minus 1 penalty to every dodge thereafter for the rest of the round. This resets when the next round starts. Now damage isn't just dealt to the target without any way to help resist it. In DDA, the armor stat serves as damage reduction. When the attacker in combat calculates their damage, they subtract the defender's armor from their total damage, meaning damage from the stat, plus any extra successes over the defender's dodge successes and any other modifiers from things like qualities, and then that is how much damage the defender takes to their wound boxes. The lowest this armor can reduce damage is 1. Characters in DDA always take at least one point of damage, no matter what. So if the attacker in the example had 15 damage and one rank of weapon, and the defender had 12 armor, the defender would take 6 damage, as the attacker has a total damage of 18 from their damage stat, weapon 1, and the extra success is added. Now, what actions can you take in combat other than hitting things? The document splits actions into two categories, standard and special. Within those categories, actions are generally split into two smaller categories, simple and complex. There are a few outliers, but those will be discussed too. Digimon and Tamers can use anything on this list. 
First up, attack. A simple action. The Tamer Digimon attacks as detailed earlier. The stats used for Tamers are described in the video on human character creation, and the Digimon use accuracy as stated earlier and in the Digimon video. Digimon cannot use the same named attack twice in a round. Next is Hold Back. This is a special type of attack as a simple action, where the Digimon or Tamer is pulling their punch, attacking with non-lethal damage, somehow. This can get sort of ridiculous to justify with certain attacks, such as Skull Greymon's Ground Zero Kai, which is a giant flesh missile that is canonically one of the strongest things it can do, and basically levels an area. If the target would be reduced to zero wound boxes, they, they go down to one instead, and are counted as out of the fight. As long as the intent is declared, the attack is held back, but you can't take this action if your Digimon is in the offensive stance, or they have a signature move that they're using. Effectively, it lets you knock out a foe that you don't want to kill. Using a skill is a complex action. The character makes a skill check. It's that simple. Now, at my advice to GMs is that if you are forcing a player to make a skill check during combat, that should be a free action. It should not consume any of their actions. They should only have to spend the complex action to make a skill check if they choose to make one of their own free will. This isn't a rule in the book, but this is what I'd recommend. It's just more fair, and it means that the players don't have to waste their action on something you're forcing them to do. Using an item is a complex action. It varies wildly depending on the setting as to what this is and what it means and what it does. So you should ask your GM what use, if any, this has in the game you're playing. And GMs, you should tell your players this during session zero. Clashing is a simple action. We're going to talk about this a little bit more later, so put a pin in it. For Movement is a simple action. The Digimon or Tamer moves a number of meters equal to a chosen movement score movement, fly, swim, teleport, etc. Terrain allowing, obviously. Moving in difficult terrain is a complex action. The GM should let the players know when an area is difficult terrain. Next is changing stances. This is a simple action. When you change stance, you change from the default, neutral stance, to defensive or offensive stance. From there, you can shift to any other stance freely as a simple action. For example, you could go from neutral to offensive, then offensive to defensive. Offensive stance increases your accuracy by 1.5 times, effectively 50%, rounded down, while inflicting a penalty to dodge equal to 50%, or an 0.5 times multiplier, rounded up. Defensive stance is the inverse of this. You increase dodge by 50% rounded down, and decrease accuracy by 50% rounded up. As mentioned, if you're in offensive stance, you can't hold back. Some qualities grant other stances as discussed in the Digimon video, and changing to them is also a simple action. For more information on those qualities, uh, specifically Sniper and Braveheart, if memory serves, you can see my video on Digimon character creation. It's in the playlist, and uh, you can check it out on my channel. Next are special actions. They're unique and often have weird limitations of some kind, but are also usually pretty useful, so don't overlook them just because they're weird. First is the direct action. A tamer can direct their partner Digimon as a simple action, giving the Digimon a bonus to either its next dodge or accuracy pool check equal to the tamer's charisma attribute. If a tamer tries to direct a Digimon that isn't their partner, they suffer a minus two penalty to the bonus granted. You cannot take this action twice in the same turn. Special orders vary wildly in how they can be used, and so you should go check out my video on human character creation for more information on which orders use simple and which orders use complex actions. Bolster lets Digimon or Tamers turn their simple action into a complex action to add plus two or plus one to that action's value or value. For example, a Tamer bolstering direct lets them add plus two to the bonus given. Digimon have two choices when bolstering attacks. They either get plus two to accuracy and damage on that attack, or add plus one to their bit or CPU for inflicting effects. Though they may only increase bit or CPU once every two rounds. Additionally, Tamers can bolster as many times as they want, while Digimon can only bolster twice per battle. Digimon cannot bolster signature moves, sneak attacks, or the clash action. Bolstering does not consume an action slot of its own for Tamers or Digimon. It just alters other actions. This means that you cannot bolster a complex action. The intercede action makes the character taking it use of a simple action on their following turn. We will discuss this in detail in a little bit, so put a pin in it. 
Called shots can be performed once per battle and can be done by either a tamer or a digimon. Tamers spend a simple action, whereas a digimon spends a complex act. The character aims at a specific area on a target, such as a body part, tool, or weapon. The first kind of called shot is sharpshooting. This is when the player is trying to cripple an enemy. The digimon's attack is counted as if it had bonus damage equal to the Digimon's stage bonus, but takes an accuracy penalty to the target's RAM and has its damage reduced by the target's CPU. Still, if the attack deals at least two damage, the called shot succeeds, and the target takes a penalty as determined by the GM. If the attack used with sharpshooting doesn't deal damage, the Digimon sharpshooting adds plus one to its effect potency, but the target gets a bonus to dodge equal to its RAM plus its stage bonus. Success by two or more over here sees the target's immunity being ignored and a guaranteed duration of two rounds. The other type of called shot is called focusing. If the called shot attack has a positive effect, the Digimon is trying to make sure it lands. If the target is a single target, the Digimon using the effect gets the effect applied to them for the same potency, but the guarantee of the buff hitting no longer applies, and the Digimon being buffed must make the target number as discussed in the effects section of Digimon creation. If the attack would buff multiple targets with an area attack, the effect has a minus one potency, but the user adds their stage bonus to their ally's health rolls to make the attack hit. You cannot focus while your Digimon is in defensive stance. Even if this fails, you cannot focus with your Digimon for the rest of the fight. Divine Protection makes the Tamer give up a simple action to negate one instance of damage they would take once per battle. This is exclusively used if the human themselves would be the recipient of an attack and can be called after a dodge check has failed. Doing this a second time costs two inspiration and cannot be used when the human throws themselves into the fray of combat recklessly. But as the document notes, if the character is doing so because they have something they feel they must accomplish no matter the risks, the GM should at the very least reward them with something. The intent of Divine Protection is to keep humans out of harm's way, and so the GM's intent should coincide with how liberal they are when using this. If the enemy's Digimon frequently attack humans to make a point or use area attacks, those are instances where Divine Protection could be invoked. Conversely, a human trying to goad a Digimon into attacking them under the assumption this action would protect them would not be able to invoke this. Ultimately, the GM has final say on when players can and cannot use their divine protection, so rule zero. Evolution costs a simple action from the Tamer. The Digimon must meet the requirements to reach the stage of evolution for the Tamer to use this action. Upon evolution, the Digimon is healed to full. Some GMs may impose a 3d6 plus willpower skill check from the Tamer on top of this to make a Digimon evolve. Failure means the Tamer cannot attempt to evolve their partner again during that round, but as mentioned, this is an entirely GM discretion option. Blind evolution is a special type of evolution that is used exclusively by Digimon. I mentioned it briefly in the Digimon evolution part of the last video, but this will go into it in detail. Not every campaign will use it, so speak to your GM beforehand if you want to take this action. If the slide evolves stage is the same as the Digimon's current stage, it's a simple action. It takes the Digimon's current wound boxes and applies them to the new evolution rather than healing any wound boxes. If the slide evolution is to a higher stage, however, the Digimon doesn't need to worry about their tamer making a willpower check and they regain the base wound box difference between the two stages. For example, a Fairymon with 10 maximum wound boxes going into Shutmon, who has 14 maximum wound boxes, would heal 4 wound boxes upon slide evolving. If the slide evolution is going from a higher to a lower stage, however, no wound boxes are healed and it's only a simple action. When combat is over, you can make a recovery check. Roll health is a d6 dice pool for Digimon, and body plus endurance is a d6 dice pool for humans. Each success, a 5 or a 6, restores one wound box. However, the GM may decide this is a moot point or save this for when many battles are fought in succession. In my opinion, it's sensible that if the party isn't going to be fighting any more foes for several hours of in-game, not real life, time, they could simply recover their wound boxes to full. This means that they have time to rest and recuperate before their next battle. Now that we've discussed all the types of actions that can be done, we're going to move on to range. Range is the distances at which a Digimon can use its attacks, and Digimon have two range values, range and effective limit. These are detailed more in the video on Digimon character creation. Mainly attacks can only be used on enemies who are adjacent to the user, which means that they are basically touching your Digimon. If you're using a square grid, this means that your Digimon's icon or token must be touching the enemies. 
If a ranged attack is fired at this range, however, the attack takes a penalty equal to the adjacent enemy's ram on its accuracy. If an area attack is used, the targets all gain a bonus to dodge equal to their ram values against the attack, regardless of where the attack was fired from. You also cannot make ranged attacks unless your Digimon can either see the target or gauge their position somehow. When you go beyond your range with an attack, your Digimon takes a penalty of minus one for every two meters you are beyond your range value until their effective limit, beyond which attacks simply miss. If the GM would rather use more vague concepts of range, they can use zone rules. Close range is melee range, long range is where ranged attacks take no penalty, and far range imposes a flat minus two to all accuracy rolls no matter the distance. A simple action move lets a Digimon go from one zone to another, but if the Digimon has 15 or more movement, they can go move two zones with a simple action. Personally, I wouldn't recommend this. It makes combat kind of muddy, in my opinion, and I personally like combat to be the most clear and mechanically sound part of any system. But it's still an option if your GM wants to use it, and uh, for some games and some groups, it might be more to your taste. I remember when I said to put a pin in interceding. We're going to get back to that now. When a character intercedes, they throw themselves in the way of an attack, making themselves the target. If your ally is being targeted, and it is within your character's movement speed and range, you can intercede. Your character can move as a part of this, and make the attacks target themselves instead of the original target. However, they don't get to roll dodge, and have to pray and rely on their armor to hold out. Interceding also consumes a simple action during that character's next round. If an attack would have an area tag, the interceding character can instead throw an ally out of the way of the range of the area, becoming the sole target of that attack. Rules for this follow the throwing rules will detail in the clashing section, so speaking of which, clashing! When you want to lock down an enemy or try and grapple them, you can spend a simple action to try and clash with them. Both participants need to be adjacent to each other unless you have reach, in which case your Digimon can initiate clashes at its reach range. When a character starts a clash, both characters make a skill check of 3d6 plus body with a target number of the other character's agility. If one participant is larger than the other, they gain a bonus to this check equal to however many sizes larger they are than the other character. If one character rolls higher than the target number mentioned before, and the other doesn't, the one who rolled higher controls the clash. If both characters beat the target number, the one who beats it by the most wins and is in control. If a tie continues, the Digimon with the higher body stack controls the clash. If the Digimon still tie, the player in the situation is in control. Digimon who are clashing can still use the movement action, but they have to keep in contact with the other Digimon, meaning they have to remain adjacent or, if you have reach, within reach range. The character in control of the clash can use the following actions as their action pool allows, but the one who isn't in control can't take any actions at all other than trying to roll and try to control the clash once per turn. Attacking works like normal, but costs a complex action instead of a simple, and it must be a melee tagged attack. The target of the attack rolls half of their dodge pool in response. Pinning is a complex action and makes it so the enemy can't try and roll to control the clash during their next turn. You may only do this a number of times equal to the difference between the controller's CPU and the other character's CPU. If the other character's CPU is higher, you only get one round of pin, so make good use of it. Throwing is a complex action. The controller throws the target a distance equal to their body stat or the far zone, depending on which rule set your GM is using. The controller deals damage to the Digimon being thrown equal to the controller's damage stat reduced by armor as normal. But if the Digimon would hit enemies, it counts as a basic ranged damage attack, with a bonus to accuracy equal to the controller's CPU. Finally, you can end the clash without spending any actions. You simply declare that you end it, and it's over. Digimon who are clashing only roll dodge against one another, but if they're attacked from the outside, they don't roll dodge at all. These attacks from outside, however, suffer a damage penalty equal to the CPU of both clashing Digimon combined. If the target of the clash is airborne and gets pinned, they begin to fall. The pinned Digimon takes damage equal to the number of meters fallen past the first five, reduced by CPU, minimum one damage. If your GM instead uses zone rules, the pin Digimon takes damage equal to the number of zones it's fallen times 5 reduced by its CPU. In either case, the controller takes no damage from this fall. These are also the general falling rules, by the way. So if your character would fall in any other way, such as being knocked off a cliff by knockback, or, you know, falling by failing a check to climb, these determine how much damage they would take. 
As mentioned, if the Digimon has any ranks of reach, it can start clashes at ranges equal to the distance it could make reach attack. The Digimon attempting to clash at range, however, takes a penalty to all clash rolls equal to the number of meters away it is from its target. If the opponent doesn't also have reach, though, they deal half damage if they attack as the controller of the clash. If the party wants to try and stop their buddy from being WWE Super Slammed, a Digimon outside can try and use a complex action to end the clash. They roll 3d6 plus body as normal against the controller, who rolls 3d6 plus agility. Size bonuses and any other clashing bonuses apply to the controller's roll, but only their base size counts, meaning the brawler quality doesn't grant its size bonus. If the Digimon contesting the clash rolls higher, the clash ends. If the Digimon controlling the clash rolls higher, the clash continues. Now, tamers in combat are ill-advised, as I've said in the human creation video, but you can do it. I discussed their derived stats in the tamer creation video, but they only get to make basic melee damage attacks, and all Digimon take their stage bonus times three less damage from tamers attacks. Minimum one, obviously. Humans can generally only hold their own against rookie Digimon, maybe champions if they're hard spec to be a combat tamer. Even then, it won't last, especially if the GM is giving enemies bonus DP to keep up with the party. I found that after the first 10, combat tamers really just sort of fall off, because they're just too at risk to keep fighting. There are ways around this Digimon with lots of effects. But, in my opinion, that defeats the purpose of combat tamers. In my mind, they should fight alongside their partner out of a sense of friendship and alliance, not use their partner as a buffing machine. In fact, this has become such a frowned upon strategy that the official server has come up with a nickname for it, Backpack Digimon. It's generally considered bad taste, so I wouldn't recommend it. If you want your combat tamers to still be useful without having to make a backpack Digimon, I would recommend looking into the skill expansion for 1.4. It's an optional document that has some abilities baked in, though they're more examples, that make combat tamers a little more viable. Again, you're still putting your tamer at risk, and you really, really shouldn't be. But sometimes, you just have to go full Masaru. However, not every battle is going to be a victory, and sometimes you're defeated. Maybe your plan was bad. Maybe you screwed up. Maybe the enemy's stronger than you thought. And maybe, just maybe, the dice decided that they hate you today. Regardless, when a character reaches zero wound boxes, they are defeated. Tamers are lucky, they only get knocked unconscious, and they're taken out of the fight. Digimon, however, are knocked down to their lowest default stage with one wound box and are often melancholy and regretful of their inability to win. If they would take enough damage from a single blow to be reduced to a negative value of wound boxes equal to or greater than their maximum wound boxes, however, for example, a Digimon with 12 wound boxes taking 24 damage from full wound boxes from a single attack, they instead become a Digitama or Digiek. Digitama have one wound box and zero armor. If this precious little bundle of potential rebirth is further damage, the Digimon could get lost forever. Ultimately, what this means is up to your GM, of course, and should be established during Session Zero to fit the tone of the game. On the note of the tone of the game, Digimon Digital Adventures 1.3 actually had rules for human character death. This was removed as 1.4, as the idea of child death, which is a very real possibility given most Digimon seasons, wasn't something that RKD wanted in the system. However, RKD has admitted that the human death can be a strong narrative tool, and as such, has recommended using the 1.3 rules, which I'm going to discuss here. Effectively, these are homebrew. Do not assume these are the baseline, and speak to your GM if you want to know if they're using these or not. If you're a GM, strongly consider against using these during your first game. They can be pretty rough, and they also require you to come up with a means of resurrecting the human, possibly. So, here's how that works. When a human is reduced to zero wound boxes, they roll 3d6. On a three or less, they die. On any other value, they just basically become unconscious for the rest of the fight. However, if the tamer would be brought into the negative, the target of the three is increased by plus one for each two points the tamer is below zero. For example, a tamer with eight wound boxes takes 10 damage. They now have to roll a four or higher to survive. 
If a tamer instead has their wound boxes brought into the negative equal to their maximum wound boxes, they die instantly, similar to Digimon. For example, the tamer above takes 16 damage from a single attack. They are brought to negative 8 and instantly killed. Again this, in 1.4 at least, is effectively homebrew. It doesn't mess with the balance in any way, but it can mess with the tone of the game. So only use this if you're going to be the GM and you want your game to be a little bit darker. And no, this is not a core rule. This is just a suggestion by the dev as to what to use if you want a darker game where humans can die. However, just as there is defeat, there is victory. Eventually, you'll defeat whatever threat has come to challenge you and put the digital and or real worlds in danger, and the game will end. Your characters have fought battles, made friends with NPCs, and grown both as characters and, well, in power. The journey's end is what the book describes this as, and it varies from the game to game. However, reaching that end isn't easy, especially for new players of DDA or TPG RPGs in general. As such, the document offers some advice, and I'll offer some based on my own opinions after. When roleplaying, the document suggests that the players first and foremost not feel limited by what the, their GM wants them to roll. Certainly, you should ask before you roll something. The worst outcome is you're told no after all, but a good GM will say yes as long as the request you've made isn't that outlandish. For example, asking to know if you have any knowledge on, oh, I don't know, a certain type of insect, that seems fine. But, but, but asking King Mamamon to give up his crown to your character as a persuade check is a little outlandish and seems a little silly. You should also be evoking your aspects, positives and negatives, when they crop up. It can lead to either failure, which opens up the door to new adventures or critical successes, which can lead to an amazing narrative moment for the player. Keep your skill values on hand. In general, it helps to have your character sheet on hand in full. The one on Google Sheets is a great option, and you can see that in the description of this video. This keeps things moving at a quick pace and reminds you of what your characters are good and bad at. Don't be afraid to roll for checks that your character sucks at, though. This can open up new opportunities for character development and growth. With Torments, you should generally try to roll them when applicable early on, so the GM gets a good feel for when to make you roll for it themselves. You should not, however, try to force a situation where they are rolled. The character you're playing wants to avoid these things, so you should try to make them act that way. For example, a character I played in the game I just wrapped up was afraid of anything that flies in a bird-like manner, slower flapping wings and the like. We had to fight ahem, several enemies who could do that, and he spent most of that fight having Vietnam flashbacks when he was dive-bombed by a pigeon as a child. And as a result, it got so bad the GM had to rule that it didn't apply, it didn't apply unless the things landed next to him. Yeah, that was a pretty bad session for him. Don't make it sue you, kids. I can story time that in a later video. If you're interested, leave a comment. Have some manners with the other players. Don't be a spotlight hog. Don't let the tension of a um situation bleed over into out-of-character arguments. And be sure that if in-character disputes or arguments occur, everyone knows it's all in-character and you're not actually beefing with the guy at the table. Remember, DDA is just a game. It's not even a, like a competitive game like Fortnite or whatever the kids play these days. The, po the point is, don't, don't start beef with people outside of the game, please. It just ruins groups. As for Digimon, don't feel bad if your Digimon's abilities are very basic. Basically, all the Digimon I've built are that built that way. Because as these videos have been established, I'm a little bit dumb. Really though, I'm a fan of simpler character builds with Digimon, because it just lets me focus more on the character than trying to remember all the mechanics. If you are going to make something more complex, however, Keep in mind, you should know everything your character can do by heart, or at least have the thing on hand to look at it and reference. Memorize it, study it, and be ready on game day. Otherwise, the game will be bogged down and nobody will like you. Yeah, not even your friend Steve, who likes everyone. He'll get mad too. And you don't want to piss off your friend Steve, do you? When you build your Digimonic character creation, feel free to skip on qualities you want and just buy them with bonus DP later. You should consider, according to the document, what is core for your build, in quotes. This falls back into what I said about stats being roughly the same spread-wise, too. It makes spending bonus DP simpler as the game goes on. In combat, you need to include all the attack tags in any attacks you want to declare. 
This avoids confusion from the GM and other players and makes it so that everyone knows you aren't trying to cheese the game in some way or cheat. If the GM forgets something that a foe would inflict onto your Digimon, feel free to politely remind them of it once or twice. This shows that you have a sense of fair play, and this will in turn make the GM more likely to cut you some slack if you have more esoteric ideas later. Just just don't be the rules lawyer and constantly remind them of how things work, and if they tell you, yeah, I know, then assume they've got something in mind and don't bring it up anymore. The rest of this is all my personal advice. Keep in mind that none of this is in the document, None of this represents Arcade's views or opinions, and all of these are my views and opinions. Do not take these as law, do not take these as rules, take these as suggestions for somebody who loves this game and really, really wants people to get the most out of it. First off, don't make an edgelord unless they have room to grow and you actually intend to have them do so. If you do make an edgelord, make it so there's a valid reason that can be overcome with help from the party. For example, Yamato, in Adventure, comes from a divorced family and as such, his bonds with his friends, the other characters and his partner, keep him from going too far down a dark path and ultimately show him that he doesn't need to be a loner. I mean, I'd still advise against Edgelords, especially as your first character, unless your Digimon is enough of a contrast and you're playing it up for comedy and everyone's sort of okay with it. This is stuff you discuss in Session Zero, but again, don't play an Edgelord. You will not have fun, nobody else will have fun, nobody will like you. Next up, Digimon. Look, I get it. Digimon are the combat-focused characters, and that's generally where they shine. But they should be people too! They might not have torments or aspects, but they can grow in their own way by helping their tamer grow. Digimon should serve to temper the worst parts of a tamer's personality by being a hard contrast, or serve to bolster the best of a tamer by complementing that tamer's best qualities. They should also have their own desires and wants. Sometimes this can conflict with the tamer, but these instances should be rare and not without solid justification. They should also want to protect their tamer from harm at all costs, but you should not let this delve into the suicidal. Don't just make them completely devoted to their tamer to the point that they throw themselves in the way of every single attack. Finally, I'd recommend that any choices you make should be made with the mindset of what would the character do? Act as they would, which might not always be the best thing for you as a player. That said, if you're going to do something particularly stupid, I'd run it by the rest of the party out of character first. My general rule is that if it only affects my character or characters, I'll do it. If it would negatively affect anyone else in the party, I'm gonna sit back, talk to them, and if they, are, if they think it's a bad idea, I'm gonna try and find a way not to do it that's justified in character, because I don't wanna mess up everyone else's experience just because my character would do something stupid. A lot of people use, it's what my character would do, to justify really dumb, edgy shit, okay? Don't be that guy. That's what that's called, you're being that guy if you do that. Take into consideration, not just your character's motivations, but everyone else's characters and all the other players at the table. It's a cooperative game, okay? You guys are working together, and hopefully you're playing it with friends. You, you don't want to screw that up. With that done, however, this is the next to last video. The last one, coming soon hopefully, if I don't get sick again, is probably going to be another longish one, because it has a bunch of stuff, and it's for GMs. It might take a little longer to record and edit and stuff, so expect it either later this week or sometime next week. The GM section is very important, however, and it does need to have high quality and be as descriptive as possible. It's like the Digimon creation video with all the qualities. So just bear with me. Thanks for watching, and I would appreciate it if you would like the video if you enjoyed it or learned something useful. Uh, toss a subscribe my way so you can keep up with any future uploads. And uh, follow me on Twitter and Twitch. Uh, especially the last one. Uh, because I'm going to be streaming a example creation of a character in DDA 1.4 after the last video gets uploaded. And then I'm going to just re-upload it to YouTube via Twitch, and that'll be up there for everyone to watch. So again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.